right. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you today. This is our final colloquium of the semester. And today I'm here to introduce uh, Mr. John Woolbright, Chief Information Officer of Omega Phi. Omega Phi is a company that provides financial communication and fundraising solutions for fraternities and sororities. It's a very unique niche. And what I've learned about it is that um, it's actually a business that they've invented in a way. They're the first ones to do it. I think in 1992 you started that program. So, or the, the firm actually, yeah. the company. So, um, Mr. Woolbright has over 25 years of professional uh, financial services industry. He's worked with Biteware, Bitewise, Tesis, and Synovus Banks, in addition to being with Omegafi now. He's also a graduate of Berry College. I'd also like to note that Mr. Woolbright and Omega Phi have recently provided four scholarship tuition scholarships, which also have an internship piece to it. So please uh, consider that as students to uh, participate in it. Um, in addition, uh, Mr. Woolbright has brought one of his co-workers, who's also an alum of ours, Mr. Josh Whaley and uh, uh, Justin. Justin, yep. I'm sorry, Justin Whaley. And um, Mr. Woolbright will probably talk a little bit about you and explain what you do with the organization. So today I want to welcome Mr. Woolbright and Megafi and Justin. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for having us here today. Uh, we consider it a great honor to be here and um, we're excited to, to meet and talk and tell you a little bit about Omega Phi um, and, and all of the interactions that we, we have with Columbus State and how important they are to us. Um, when we were talking about with Hunter about what would be important to hear, um, one of the things that we were saying is a lot of times when you're in college, you really don't know what the next step is. Uh, you just, you're, you're wondering what does that next step look like um, after college? You know, questions that you might have is what do employers expect of me when I get out? How is that going to work? Uh, what types of jobs are out there. So you, you come from high school, then you finally figure out what you're going to do, and then you get into this great unknown of, you know, what even types of jobs are out there. How do I get my foot in the door? So I have no experience. How do I get that first job? Uh, how do I prepare myself now for whatever that next step is going to be? Um, you also probably asking, well, what skills do I need? And there's businesses need all different types of skills, and sometimes uh, combinations of skills. I think it's always interesting to look at companies like Apple and Google, and somehow they combine high tech and liberal arts, and you just never know what skill sets may be needed for for the next thing, um, and what jobs are available. And then you may also be asking, well, what does a career path look like? And so I'm gonna introduce Justin in a few minutes and let you have you know some time to just talk about that because Justin was a graduate of CS, CSU and has made a, a long career with us we hope and a long one to, to come. Uh, a little bit about me, uh, I'm from Columbus, uh, Georgia. Uh, I grew up here, I was born here. I went to school here at, uh, in high school. I went to uh, Brookstone High School. Um, at that time, there were not even personal computers in the world. I know that may be impossible for the millennials and, and your generation to believe, but there was no computers. Uh, and my grandfather bought the uh, Apple IIc and brought it home. And my uncle, who was a professor here, Dr. Dr. Woolbright, he taught here for 30 years. He was, in, he was into computers at that time. He was a math teacher here, but they were trying to transition him to a computer science teacher. And we had that Apple IIc, and I learned how to program that thing. And I thought, this is the most phenomenal machine I've ever, this is so much fun. And I got interested in computers. And so that's, that's kind of um, the track that I wanted to get on. Um, so after high school, uh, I went to Berry College, which is in Rome, Georgia, and had to try to figure out what do I want to do with my life. And I couldn't make a decision on what my major was. I like math, I like business, I like computer science. 
And I couldn't figure out what to do, so I picked a new major that they had called Decision Science. And it's a combination of all three, and it was basically a, like a math major or business major or computer science major and a minor in the other two. So I majored in with a computer science and kind of minored in the other two. What was interesting was when I got up there, um, everybody is required to work at Barry. You couldn't be a student on campus without having a job. So you have to work. That was a requirement of being a student, uh, which I like because I got paid for it. Um, but uh, when I got there, I didn't have a good job, so I was on grounds crews. So that's like the worst job you can have. You know, you got to go around and you're in the hot sun all day and it's 100 degrees and you want to get out of there as fast as you can. So immediately I start trying to find another job, you know, anything but work crew. And uh, I met a political science professor up there. Which I didn't care about history or poli sci or anything, but uh, Dr. Chaitram Singh, uh, I got to know him and I got to be his graduate assistant and I learned so many things that uh, have helped me the rest of my life and uh, that I've even applied in my at, at, uh, at my work. So uh, all of those things and all those decisions kind of come into play. Um, the one thing that I did get out of Barry, uh, I don't know how much I remember about all the all the classes I took. I, I, I don't know if I could remember too much, but I did remember one thing. Martha Berry, who started that college, said, you need to work with your head, your heart, and your hands. And I, that's the one thing I do remember about my education, besides it cost me a lot of money to go there. But, but I, I always, it always struck me as that's important. So you gotta, you gotta get knowledge, and you gotta put it in your head, and you gotta have some kind of passion about what you're doing and um, where to apply it. And you gotta put it into practice. So if you know it and you like it, but you don't put it into practice, it's almost no good. You gotta put it into practice and apply it. Uh, and that was, that was some of the things that kind of helped make me kind of who I am. I started, well, uh, after I graduated from Barry, I, my next logical step was the step that many of you are at right now, which is what do I do next and how do I get there? Um, I kind of wanted to be uh, an, like an operating system designer. That was kind of my dream. I thought, man, this would be fun. At the time, they used to make PC Magazine, and I'd read that, and IBM and Microsoft were really big, and they were coming out with Windows 95 or Windows 3.1. It was the first graphical operating system. I just thought that was the most magical thing. That, my dream job was to work for Microsoft. So I applied at Microsoft, I applied at IBM, and that was in the days of Windows versus OS 2. I don't know, do any of y'all even know what OS 2 is? That was the big thing, but IBM was the, the big player in that. And I sent my resume, and of course, I got the denial letters, you know. Here's the standard denial letter. So I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I just, you know, how do I, how do I, how do I get in the door? And two Georgia Tech graduates started a company here in town called Bitewise Development. And somehow or another, they heard about me. And they had a small company, and they decided to offer me a job. And so I took it. And it was one of the best things that I ever did because I learned more from two guys that graduated from Georgia Tech in 12 months than I probably learned the rest of my life. They taught me a lot of stuff and it's helped me uh, and it helped me grow. And so I worked, worked for there. Uh, and then TSIS, which they're obviously sponsor a lot of programs here, uh, hired me from there. And uh, I did a number of things there. So I helped them install their local area networks. And I got exposed to mainframe computing, which, believe it or not, there's still a lot of that out there. Um, I never was interested in that, but by necessity, and because that's what they do, I had to learn how mainframes work. So I learned a lot about mainframes. I didn't really want to, but, um, but I did learn some things, and a lot of those things have, have helped me. And then I moved into maybe one of the worst jobs you could possibly have, which was I managed our tandem operations. And tandem was uh, specialized computers or fault tolerant computers. Everything's got a backup, nothing goes down. And those computers are used for all the visa authorization. So when you swipe your visa card, all those visa cards are coming to these tandem computers that never go down. And 
Um, they do have problems from time to time, especially when you're doing thousands of transactions on them. And you definitely don't want to be the last person to touch it when that happens. And so there's a lot of pressure and you get called a lot. And I did that for two or three years. and. I, it was getting tough on me, and about that time, uh, there was a guy that worked in HR at, um, at uh, TSIS, and uh, he was the brother of Todd, or brother-in-law of Todd Reeves, and he said, hey, my brother-in-law has uh, got this little idea. He graduated from Auburn. Uh, he's the treasurer of his fraternity. He decides he wants to go out and do billing and collection for fraternal, and soror fraternal organizations and sorority organizations throughout America. Uh, could you help him? And so we went out to Mike and Ed's barbecue. And he showed me a system and I said, yeah, you need to do kind of what we do at TSIS. And so I started helping him. This was back in about 1995. So I would work all day at TSIS and then at night, he would come over at six o'clock, my wife would cook dinner, and we would work till two o'clock in the morning. And then, I, I did this pretty much for free for him because I liked him, I wanted to see the company grow. And so I kept my job, day job at TSIS and then I'm kind of moonlighted with him, helping him get this thing going. Uh, and then about 1999, he said, we, we were up to you know 300 uh, organizations that we're processing for and that's kind of my next step which is I went full-time with him but what really got us there was uh, uh, and we had about 50 organizations that we processed for and we had this big network of modems that people dialed up and we talked to them and I had hired this guy at TSIS right out of college and he was I got to talking to him and he was telling me, he goes, you ever heard of this thing called the internet? I'm like, no, what's the internet? Never heard of it. And so he was like, well, it's on every college campus in America. And so immediately I went home that night and I said, Todd, you're not gonna believe this. There's a network that is on every college campus in America. It's called the internet. Let's put this business on the internet. And when we put it on the internet, that's when it, it just exploded. And so we were kind of the first really software as a service that was out there. Um, so I came to work with Todd full time in 1999, and I stayed with Omega Five for a couple of years. And Synovus called me, um, and I went to be their chief technology officer. And so I worked on banking applications, ATMs, reward programs, uh, data centers. There's a data center out there near Moon Road. I helped design that data center there. Um, so I got to do just a number of different things with lots of different vendors all over the country and different applications, which I enjoyed. I think one of the biggest things that I'm most proud of there is I, um, was that I got inducted into the uh, American Banker Hall of Fame for a design for uh, service-oriented networks. So we, we had thousands of vendors and nothing was talking to each other. So we built a service-oriented network. It was like one of the first that any bank had done. And so I helped design that, but I had a huge team, but uh, we got inducted into the Hall of Fame for that. So I was, I was pretty proud of that. Um, so then about eight years ago, um, the banking business was not as great as it used to be, as if you remember the mortgage meltdown. And I was kind of looking to do something different. And Todd and I have, worked together for many years and we decided we were going to take, try to take Omega Phi to the next level. So I came back and joined Omega Phi um, and we started really growing. We had over 3,500 organizations that we processed bills for uh, and we had some ideas of, hey, let's build national databases and let's, let's add officer purchasing cards to our system. and. Uh, let's add contract management. And we, we've had all of these ideas and uh, mobile applications, and we've done all of those. Um, and so it's been fun. Uh, but then about a year and a half ago, we had gotten up to about 100 employees, and we had a company out of New York called Aqualine Investment Technology say, hey, we want to build a new, we, we've been researching uh, a new segment and we think Omega Phi could be the first company of many that we can put together to build a, a whole new business. Um, and, so, um, and so they did and they brought a huge investment and since then we've brought in six other companies so we're kind of the lead company 
and we do all the payments processing, but we bought companies that are in the golf industry, companies that do camp management, or we, we process one of the largest sports camps, uh, summer camps now in, um, uh, in America. So we've got all these different businesses and we're pioneering this group management space. So anybody that's processing for Boy Scouts or museums or s certain niche groups that have certain kind of characteristics about their process that is unique and they serve those industries and they process payments, we're, we're kind of doing that. So it's a really exciting time to be uh, in the company. Just looked the other day, I think we're like 250 people. Um, that's kind of surprising to me because when I joined TSIS there were 400. I'm going, ah, we're well, more than half as big as that now. So, you know, we, we're hoping to be up to 20 companies by, you know, December of next year. So, and we're all over the country. So we're in sil everywhere from Silicon Valley to New York to Washington State. So it's, it's been kind of fun to, to see that. Um, what have I learned in 25 years that I can share with you that I think would be important? Um, and for me, it's the values that Omega Phi holds. One is agility. You got to be agile. You got to change. You got to be willing to change. My favorite philosopher, a guy named Louis Grizzard. Does anybody know who Louis Grizzard is? He used to write for the Atlanta paper. He said, It's a dog eat dog world out there, and I'm wearing milk bone underwear. That's what it's like. And if you're, if you don't adapt and and be and have an agile personality, you're not going to make it in the world. And it's twice as hard now at with where you guys are coming out than it was when I was. You have to be agile. Uh, innovation is huge too. You got to have an innovative spirit. I mean. Um, there was an uh, author named uh, G.K. Chesterton that wrote one of my favorite books called The Club of Queer Trades. If you've never read it, you should read it. It's about that thick. But you can get into this club, but one of the main uh, requirements is that you have to invent your own job. You can't go find another job. You have to invent your industry. And so you'll read these short stories about these people that have jobs that you're like, what is going on? Why is he doing this? And then you find out at the very end of the story that they invented a whole new industry. And that's kind of what Omega Phi did. This industry didn't even exist, and now it's all over the country. So you have to be innovative. Um, this year, we're actually going to be a keynote at VMware World uh, with Dell. And their, their president is actually going to have us on their keynote, which, I mean, there's like 100,000 people there. I couldn't believe they're asking a little old Omega Phi in Columbus, Georgia, but we're the first company in America to install and run VMware's cloud foundation. And it's a new software that they had, and, um, and we've kind of the, the test case for them. And so they're going to have us on stage with 100,000 people with Dell CEO telling a little old Omega Phi story. So, not sure how many people are trying to hack us after that. That's, there's things that come with that. Um, trustworthiness. That's a big one. You, you got to be trustworthy. I mean, everybody that comes into our company, I mean, we do background checks and everything like that, but we hire them because we trust them. And we trust them to take care of our stuff, and we trust them to take care of our customers' things. So. Um, Personal excellence, that's another value that we have in Omega Phi, and that's just do your best. Make, make yourself the best that you can be, and uh, don't, don't let yourself off light. You know, set high expectations and, and keep that. Uh, confidence with humility is another one of our values that has carried us. Is you, have to, you have to be competitive. You gotta get out there, you gotta know you got a good product, but you also gotta be humble. You can't be overconfident. You, you need to balance confidence and humility. And finally, it's customer service. You know, Todd invented this business. He says, you know, you got to find a problem and you got to solve it. And that's what we do. So we, we spend a lot of time on customer service. We'll do almost anything for our customers. Um, and finally, I would just say, you know, when you're looking as you're getting out of college and you're trying to find out what employers want, um, one of the things that's been helpful to me in my life is, is the three circles. Um, so you, the first question you ask yourself is, what am I good at? 
and you want to figure that out and write that down on a piece of paper. And then there's a circle that's what needs to be done. So that circle's real big, I promise you. We got more things that need to be done than you can shake a stick at. And then the final piece of it is, what do I love to do? And wherever those circles intersect, that's where you want to be in your life. You want to do something you're good at, do something you love to do, and do something that needs to be done. And if you're working in that little place, then you're going to be pretty happy. Um, why is CSU important to Omega Phi? I, I don't even know where to start here. Most of our IT is made up of CSU graduates. We wouldn't even have a company if it wasn't for Columbus State University. Um, we built this thing from the ground up from a lot of graduates. And some of people, I've got to see people that are here are working interns or have worked interns or still work for us, but um, we could not be where we are without Columbus State. Um, we have all kinds of roles. We have business analyst roles. We have people that write data maps. We have people that test edu uh, applications. We have people that write programs, design websites. We have network administrators. We have security people. We have people that write mobile apps. And I'll tell you a little bit about the database. We have people that do nothing but just manage all the data that we have. We have customer service people that answer the phone. We have financial analysts. We've got all kinds of different skill sets that, that we need. Um, and we need people with the values that I talked about to, to do those. And so, you know, that was why it was really easy for us to go, we need to do more with Columbus State. I mean, we wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for that. You know, we need to make an investment. Uh, and so we wanted to get together with Hunter and we started these four scholarships. And, um, you know, hopefully there will be full rides and then there will be an intern piece with it. So we're still learning how this will work. But, you know, that way you're, you've got knowledge. You can then come and do some work at Omega Phi. We'll get some benefit from that, but also you get some benefit from it because, you know, if you were a mega file scholar, you get to come in and see how work actually happens, you know, what types of work there, there are. Maybe try two or three different things and find out what you're good at and, and learn. And so uh, we're excited to be, um, have that a part of what we do. And you, know, you may or may not ever come to work for us. Some of our interns have come to work and come full time. and. Um, some have come and then moved on to another job, and that's fine too. Um, and and some have gone and you know potentially work for other people that we might be that might be vendors of ours. So we're happy to have Columbus State as part of our um, as part of our family, and we're excited about investing in that. And hopefully today you've got a little bit of flavor of what it's like. I've given you a little, you know, how does it work for my career? You know, I start out with a little programmer and you know, I'm CIO and didn't have a company and kind of helped invent one. And so you just, you got to, you never know where it's going to take you and each step along the way is an important. And um, with that, I'm going to talk about Justin. Justin, um, I think he was like maybe the first or second person that I hired when I came back to Omega Phi. It was, it was second because you hired Mitch before me. Okay, yeah. So and Justin is hopefully a, a life lifetimer at Omega Phi, but Justin started out and he, he was a web programmer and he programmed on one of our systems for a while and we had a database person that left and we were going to go find one and he came to us and says, you know, I think I might want to do that. So. We send him to training. We're like, yeah, that would be great. And so now he's been in our he he's been in our database, and he was the first one there, and he ran them all. And you know, we got a team of three or four now that are working. That Justin trains them, he manages them, and he's, his career path has just gotten huge. And we trust all of our data with <laughs> with um, with Justin, and that's a big responsibility because we have a lot of data. And we process lots of payments, and so that's a just the amount of trust that we have in Justin is amazing in, in his team. And so I brought him to also you know let him tell you what it's like to be a a uh, you know a graduate here and an alum, and 
you know, let you also ask any questions you might have him of, you know, how do I get in the door? What's a career path look like? What skills do I need? And he's a real life example of what we're talking about. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for that, John. Um, I am I'm an alum from CSU. Uh, I started at, uh, at Omega Phi about six years ago. And um, I will say first and foremost, I wouldn't be where I am today without this program. Uh, being at CSU, the people that I met, the teachers that I had, um, you all made a significant impact in my life and changed the trajectory of where I ended up. Um, that being said, when you move into a career, when you leave this phase of your life and you go on, the amount of things that you will learn are just going to be dwarfed by what you've, what you've learned here. Um, I learned so much in Dr. Khan's class and Dr. Yang's classes, Dr. Summers, Dr. Abondo, like these fantastic teachers that, that give you this knowledge. But then when you go to the real world, when you go and you get a job, you sit down and you'll realize, I haven't learned anything yet. Like, I've, I've, had, I've had new guys sit down and they'll, they'll sit down and they'll tell me, they'll say, I've learned more in a week than I've learned in the last year. And that's because, one, just the way the world works, but two, the culture that we have at Omega Phi is a teach first culture. And when I came in, I mean, these guys, we have guys that have you know, been employees, they can testify. When we, when we come in, you know, when you get a job working for a company, the expectation is that you will work hard, that you want to learn, that you want the company to succeed, and you want to succeed. And if you bring those attributes with you, you're going to do good. Because really, what they want is someone with an able mind. And this program gives you the foundation to do that. We've seen it time and time again. We get fantastic graduates out of this program. Um, do you guys have any specific questions? Do you have any? Anybody? Like I said, up here and talk. Yeah. But we want to open it up for questions and you know, ask away. How many CSU uh, graduates you have hired from our department totally? We've hired a bunch. Currently, right now, I would say three quarters of the department. Probably. At least twelve. From, uh, from, from, mm -hmm. yeah, okay. from the computer science well, department, I would say at least 12. And we probably had one on my team. at least 15 or more interns. Yeah. A couple of them are sitting in the room. Yeah. <laughs> we have one that's working with us now. How big is your company? We are 237 as of a couple of days ago. Those are all over the country. Um, there's about 120 here locally, and then everybody else is at different companies from Arizona to Silicon Valley to New York to Washington State and Missouri, I think. So we're, we're adding, and we, you know, we're adding about a company every couple of months now. So we'll go out and find companies that are in group management, so they, they process payments and systems for specific groups or gr groups of people and then we look to acquire those so it's where our business is kind of changing now it's not just focused on the greek community it's focusing on this group management space that again has never been invented there's nobody out there in it we're kind of building it figuring it out we don't have all the answers we just know it's new and where we want to be and uh, we do business with um, close to 3,000 undergraduate organizations today. Um, our database application does essentially um, crowdsourcing. So we have the, the undergraduate billing system that we use to bill dues and fees to our members acts as a conduit for data because the, the, the new business model that we've built is essentially we sell applications not just to the undergrads but also to the national partners. And used to, the way that worked is you would have to, they would send in their paper information, they would have to enter the system, do just manual data entry. Our undergrad system actually feeds data into the national databases now, and so we have clients that are coming on board where they will, instead of having to take manual paper reports, they actually receive the reports through our billing system, and it aggregates up to their business. And so today, last time I checked, it's a little over three million members yeah. in our system that we're managing, um, all over the country, up to Canada. Do we go international anywhere besides Canada? Mm -hmm. Mainly, mainly Canada. Canada based. Um, but we, we have a, a, a large database, we have a large number of organizations, and uh, we're bringing, we have two more in the pipe right now, we've got three more coming next year, uh, mm -hmm. work with the national partners that sit over top of the, the organization, so um, we interact with a lot of people. Uh, as, as the company gets bigger and you acquire more you know, related companies and companies are related, what's your projected growth in the next 
like two years, five years? Yeah, well, we're hoping to, to be over 20. Oh, yeah, it'll be a lot larger. You'll yeah, and, and part of the business model, too, is we feel like, and this is already happening, um, but, you know, so we acquired a company out of Silicon Valley. Well, Silicon Valley's pretty expensive for programmers, but it's pretty expensive for anybody. So they want us to hire people and put them here, and they work in Silicon Valley there because it's, it's much cheaper. Um, you know, so we're we're gonna we're gonna be growing like crazy, helping, and, and then I think as we get bigger too, we'll probably take on more IT related things. So you know, it'll probably be in our our cloud, and they'll probably need more security around them, and we'll need to help them program them, you know, supplement programming skills and things like that. So it's also going to be just a lot of different interesting types of jobs. I think customer service is kind of what we started with, so we're we're hiring people in, for, in customer service here. So Omega Phi is becoming the hub for all of these companies that we're purchasing, and we're hoping to be at like 20 by the end of next year. Uh, what all technologies do you all use in the IT department? Yeah, we use, uh, for us, we use PHP a lot uh, for programming. Um, we're starting to do a lot more with Ruby and some of the JavaScript frameworks. And then we use uh, database, SQL databases, obviously, on the back end. Uh, and, we, and we're kind of doing a lot of service layer stuff now that we, we didn't do before. Um, so those are kind of the main ones. We do a lot with Unix and a lot, uh, a lot, we, a decent amount of Windows stuff too, but mostly for corporate. Uh, most of our systems run on Unix, Linux based type of things. It's a hybrid environment. We do PHP and Ruby on Rails for the web environment, like John said. Um, we built a service oriented architecture or a RESTful API that sits on top of um, our, our database platform. The mobile apps consume it, the web apps consume it. Um, we build um, responsive bootstrap web interfaces mm -hmm. that sit on top of those services and pa they power the front end that our users use. So they either use the web application <coughs> being fed from the RESTful services or a web accessible version using responsive design. That's been our, that's been our aim for the last couple of years. It's been, it's been neat. It's a good question. I will say this, so some of the newer companies that we're acquiring too, uh, they're doing a lot of .NET, not much Java, um, but a lot of, or I see a lot of .NET type of things and applications that are out there. A lot of the ones that we've acquired are in the .NET space. And you said earlier, Justin, that real learning starts when you enter the workforce in the real world, right? That's, uh, that's when it started for me a second time. I learned a lot while I was here. I did, and it gave me a great foundation. Um, but you don't know what you don't know. And when you, I just wanted to reassure people, because there's often a fear when you, you graduate college, you have a, almost an imposter syndrome. You think, all these guys around me are so smart, the people that I'm gonna go work with, those guys are so smart. And they are, they are very smart. But nobody's got it figured out, and everywhere you go, they're gonna require you to know different things, to have different skills, and they don't have an expectation that you're gonna come in with that. They have an expectation that you're gonna come in with a good attitude, and you're gonna wanna learn that. Um, I just wanted to say that because we hire a bunch of new people and that's always the first question they'll ask me, they'll pull me aside, they'll say, well, I don't know how to do this, am, am I going to get in trouble? I'm like, no, nobody thinks you know how to do that. <laughs> that's why I'm here, that's why I'm tra training you right now, that's what this was for. So what we say is that we, what we are about here is, you know, teaching you to learn. Absolutely. So you learn, mm -hmm. learn, so that when the that's real right. learning time comes, you're ready. Right. That's right. And you never know when that time's going to be. So can I ask you, what did you learn here, if anything, uh, that you found most useful when the real learning started? Um, the best education that I got um, came actually from working for the department. Um, learning, work, when I worked under Dr. Summers, when I worked as a, as a, as a tutor, Teaching other people was the best way to learn, and um, it gave me a foundation for where I am now because I believe firmly, I've, some of the best employees we've ever had, I ask them every time, I say, did you ever work in the lab? Did you work as a tutor? And almost always they tell me yes because they learn to speak to people, they learn to put their, their, their mind in where someone else is and work through the end of a problem. And those are skills that will reflect well in your career because 
99% of the time, you're not going to be building something from scratch. You're going to be maintaining legacy code. Someone has something that you need to build and improve upon. And being able to put yourself in that mind frame and work forward, those, are, those skills are valuable. Is good? Thank you. Question for Justin? Just a quick, um, two things. One, how many people do you have reporting to you? Uh, I have two uh, full-time employees and we're about to have another one. So I have three, I have a team of four including myself. And, and what is the most challenging aspect of your job? The most challenging aspect of being a database administrator is um, the pressure and the responsibility because your position like, there's a lot of things that go along with that job, but first and foremost, your job is to protect the data and ensure integrity. And so having to deal with the constant threat of losing data, um, corrupting data, it, there's a, it's your pay, the, 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 the job comes with stress. The job comes with um, the understanding that there's a lot of things that come with it, and someone has to be responsible for them. And so there's, you have to be very meticulous, you have to be very careful, you have to go through the steps, you uh, try to automate as much as you can because that way you can't mess it up. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's, the, that's the challenging. The rewarding part is that you get to work with some very intelligent people and you get to do something that not everybody's good at, but it's a skill that works well with other people. So we find out in our teams, we've, you know, we've grown from a smaller company where you kind of have to be good at everything to being able to afford to let people be good at one thing over another. And you know, we stress to people, it's like, I want you to learn, I want you to be challenged, I want you to stretch yourself, but at some point, you need to just ask for help. And, and once you get there, you get two really smart people that are really good at what they do working together on that thing. And it, it's, it's a lot of fun to, to be a force multiplier and to, to work with people and be like, hey, let me show you, let me help you make your job easier. That thing that was gonna take you three hours, I can do it in 15 minutes. And it's not because I'm smarter than you, it's because that's all I do. <laughs> Uh, the encryption. What kind of encryption do you use for the database? Because the reason I ask you this question is That's a personal question. even for you, <laughs> you know, John said that you, you, he put trust on you, right? I mean, they you know, the slow that for the people over there. So I want to make sure the data, you mean not you, yourself cannot access somehow right. if you don't need to. Right. So, so what, what is that encryption scheme you use? So to protect our backups, we use uh, SHA-512 uh, on the backup scheme. Um, and we don't keep um, sensitive data. We tokenize our cards, and we use TSIS as a, pro as a processor. So we don't have um, the credit card information that we're not supposed to have. In addition to that, um, everything is, so any private non-public information that we have is encrypted. So, um, and the keys are protected. I'm not telling you where they are. <laughs> <laughs> and then all the information that we don't ever need to recover is hashed. So, um, passwords, sensitive information, or, uh, security questions, things like that. We just want to hash that stuff because we don't need to know what it was, just mm -hmm. that you yeah, know yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great, thank you. Um, so, I a kind of question for both of you guys, really. Um, you just mentioned earlier how you <clears throat> I'm having a hard time getting your foot in the door, mm -hmm. and I wanted to get your perspective on, you know, how you see it now. Now that you're looking at it from the other end of the spectrum, you know, because you're you're the guy looking down as opposed to looking up, and then also your perspective on, on <coughs> basically a high level view of how you guys look at uh, getting your foot in the door. Well, the one thing I think, and it's one of the reasons we wanted to do the scholarship was. To, with a work component was to get that experience. A lot of time you show up and you, you, you got two resumes and this person has experience. You're like, well, I can't get experience. I just got out of school, you know? So that's what we want to do. We want to be part of that process and go, you know, well, come to work with us and be a part of that scholarship and do an internship. You may not even like the job you're doing, but it doesn't really matter. You learned something, you applied it and you can put it on your resume and so when you go to that first job interview guess what i've already done that or you know and so that's where we feel like we can help because we get a benefit from it because we're getting new ideas like i was telling you the guy i hired from college that taught me what the internet was i mean you you guys are are learning the most new stuff and so you bring new ideas to us so we get a lot of value from just you know, just learning about what's important and, you know, what's culturally relevant and things like that. And we, hopefully maybe we can provide that a little extra skill set that says, okay, I've, I've applied my skill set, I've learned, you know, I either learned I liked it I'm not, and I want to keep doing it, or I learned I didn't like it, I want to go do something else. And that's fine too. Um, 
So we're, we're hoping that you know, we can be part of that process. So you're to make it simpler. On, to build on that, um, we've been doing, we've been hiring a lot of people. We've grown rapidly over the last six months. Mm -hmm. Hired four people. Four people. Four people. Yeah. And I mean, that's a lot. There were only four people in there. Developers there when I got there. Um, but as I've, I've been getting to participate in, in the interview process and things like that, and the only thing I could say is one. Um, a surefire way is to do like John said, come in for internships, things like that, because the bar is going to be lower. So if you're still, especially if you're still a student, the expectation, the, the amount of hours that are required is going to be a lot lower. So you get your foot in the door that way and you build rapport with the people. So if you've wanted a job with that company, they're not interviewing your resume or they're not viewing you as they saw you in those 15 minutes. They're judging you for the last, you know, six months that you were there and what kind of work you did there. And a lot of times, your personality carries through, your work ethic carries through, and that's, a, that's really hard to convey in a 45-minute you know, interview. But what I will say is that, specifically for Omega Phi, we're a culture-first company, we hire for the culture. If we believe that you're capable and you're a good culture fit, you're gonna get the job. Because it's a lot easier, I'm sorry? Do you hire internationally this week? Uh, we have mm -hmm. had, yeah, we've had, we've had, uh, yep. yep, we've, we've had, had interns from, yep, we had, other. we've had internships, we haven't uh, done a full time hire yet, but uh, yeah. I, I imagine it'd be pretty much similar. Um, so, a lot of times, sometimes those can be challenging with H1Bs and things like that. So, we honestly, we don't have a lot of experience doing that, but We're flexible, yeah, we figure it out mm -hmm. if, for, for the right candidate. Mm -hmm. For these kinds of positions, you can be the smartest person in the world, and I don't want to work with you. Because if you're if you're pain, if you're constantly contrary, if you always want to fight or argue with someone and disagree, you can't get along with your coworkers, you're not worth it. And so have a good attitude, come in prepared, um, double check your resume and make sure that you know you don't have a lot of grammatical errors. But if you got a stack of thirty resumes and you're trying to get rid of some so you can narrow them down, get rid of the people that couldn't be bothered to make sure that they spelled everything right and that they used good grammar on their resume. Um, be prepared. Go into the interview with the, your resume and the job description because they're going to be reviewing both and you don't want to have to be looking over the table at their copy. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Uh, thank you. Yeah. And you also can pick up some networks. Networks are a good way to get another job. That's what we were talking about on the way over as we're like, you know, even if you don't work for us, you might meet 10 people and those 10 people go to 10 other companies and they know you and you might can get through that network get your foot in the door somewhere else. You know? I got my. I didn't get my job because I applied for it. I got my job because of Dr. Summers and Dr. Woolbright. <laughs> we were hiring, and I called and said, "Who's the smartest person about to graduate in the computer science program?" Wow. Good for you. And then they sent Justin over. <laughs> I said, "Don't worry, he's coming." <laughs> um, anybody else have any questions? Uh, I wonder, actually, are there any skills you wish to develop, develop here before facing the real world outside? Any particular skills you wish you have developed here? Sure. Um, I mean, there's there's some that um, I feel like, one, it's obviously easy for me to be judgmental about my field because I know I've invested a lot in it, and so it's easy to say, I wish that you knew more about my field, so I'll come back to that. But uh, there's a, a focus or a, a I don't want to say a lack of focus, it's a lack of uh, preparation. I, I realize a lot of students come out of, out of um, programs in general, because it's not just here, we get it from all our applicants, where they don't like working in teams because they've had okay. peers that don't pull their weight, that don't do a good job, and unlike work, where your boss will tell you, stop it, or you're gonna get fired, mm -hmm. here, it's like, oh, well, I'll just, I'll coast by and get a C, and that student didn't want to see. So there's an aversion to wanting to do group work, and then two, understanding how groups work together in a professional environment, using version control, using proper documentation for teams, things like that. Um, there's a lot of tools like that, like uh, GitHub, uh, Bitbucket, things like that. Like the just exposure to version control, working in teams, doing, integrating their code. And I know that you guys have, have changed a little bit, of, especially the senior software engineering. I've heard really good stuff about uh, the way that those programs have been changed. Um, that's That was really something that, it took me a little while to learn, but um, it, didn't, it didn't hinder me. Okay. No. Oh, great questions. A lot of interview questions. Um, that's a hard question to answer, but I mean, we, we ask questions that 
probing around the values that they have and what's important to them. And, and we look and we kind of compare that against like the values set that I told, told you. So, you know, might be questioning about, you know, give me, a, give me an example where you had to adapt to something that happened that you didn't like. And we, we try to ask questions that we can solicit information that can match up to see, does that, does that match up to what we value and what we know will help make us successful? Mm -hmm. A lot of times we'll ask questions about like, when's, um, when did you make a mistake? Like some, tell me about a time that you learned from a mistake you made. And if the person legitimately can't come up with a way that, or like, especially someone with a long career, can't come up with a legitimate problem that they had to deal with, they've either never done anything of significance or they're lying to me. Um, so it's, it's questions like that. It's how do you handle the stress of being thrown a question like that? How do you handle confrontation? How easy are you to talk to? Do I have to pull your teeth to get you to, tell, to answer my questions? Um, or are you telling me about these things that you're passionate about and these things that you're interested in and your goals and where you want to see yourself? Are you asking me a bunch of good questions about the company? Do you know anything about the company? Those kinds of things lead to a good culture fit. That, that lets me think, this person will fit in really well. We have a, a really young, vibrant culture at Omega Phi. We, you know, everybody, it's, it's really weird. People get along and you can ask people that aren't the ones up here telling you about us. You can ask people that work for us or did work for us. We have a, a very strong, positive culture. People get along, we have after work activities and people come and we don't have to make anybody. We, have, we do philanthropies for the Boys and Girls Club, and people are happy to spend their time on the weekend. I had a guy that came to, to our company from TSIS. He took a pay cut to come work for us because he wanted to work with us. And he had complained and complained to me about the stuff he was doing when he was working there. And he was helping us out for a fundraiser we were doing for the Boys and Girls Club on Saturday. And just kinda, he just kind of had a weird look on his face. I said, what? And he said, I would never, ever do this at my last job. I would never work for free on the weekend for a fundraiser they were doing, I would tell them that they know where they can go. I'm not doing this. <laughs> it's just a different culture. And um, it helps us retain people. It helps us retain mm -hmm. good people. Um, the reason that we are where we are is because we have good people. That, that's a big piece of it. A lot of times there's been people that maybe this person has more skills, but we just know from asking the questions, they're just not gonna work well on our team. And, and so we might pick the person that has less experience, but we know they have those cultural values and always it happens. They come in and they learn and they, they get new knowledge and they, you know, we teach them and then they're an incredible performer that's helping get us to the next level. So. It's so ironic that you know, in a field where uh, you have to be, well, some people say they flock to it because they don't want to work with people. Mm -hmm. You have to be so personable and team oriented, and that's you know, a big part of the that's true. culture. And I think that's just because of supply and demand. We're in a field where hard skills are, are plentiful and soft skills are not. And so the people with the soft skills are typically the ones that have a have a piece of the puzzle that other people don't. It's the thing that makes you stand out because. Yeah, you can sit at a desk and just do the work that you're given and, and go home, and that's fine. Companies are full of people like that, and, every, and we need them to make the economy go. But if you're going to get up in front of a client or talk to someone on the business side, uh, help manage and coach a product, a, a product that you care about from an idea to implementation, you're going to have to have those soft skills. You're going to have to be able to talk to people. You're going to have to be able to explain to people why they can't have everything they want and why we're doing the best we can and what we're giving them is actually what they need. And you have to be able to do that in a tactful way. Because if you can't, then you rub people the wrong way. It makes it harder for people to work with our department. Things just, they grind to a halt. But that's, that's a good point. It's a, it's a, it's a good observation. It's a good question. Yeah, one more. I was kind of playing off of Dr. Hotnot's question um, regarding what you feel like you may have lacked from your learning here. Um, what would you say I don't know, the difference or the difficulty of bridging the gap between like, for development, for core, core language versus using uh, various frameworks <coughs> and how important, how heavily does that weigh in your decision? To make a, a higher? Right, or to, yeah, exactly. To, to me, having someone who's learned a bunch of languages and worked with a bunch of frameworks, it's not the fact that they've learned them because I'm gonna be completely honest with you, without like working with someone with, that's got a lot of experience, it's probably sort of tentative. 
Um, but it does show passion, and it shows someone who's willing to work in the free time because nobody asked you to do that. Right. Like you had the wherewithal to go do that on your own, on your free time, because you wanted to better yourself. And a continual learner and a self improver will always be the best employee. So it's not about what you've learned and specifically what skills you've gathered, although some are more valuable than others. To me, it's that you did. Like that's what matters. And you can demonstrate. I didn't just do this because I want to check a box on my resume. Right. I did this because it's something that's interesting to me because our field changes rapidly. You will spend three years learning about a technology that we will come up with something that makes it absolutely irrelevant two years from now. I mean, it just will. Right. So you have to not see that as a lost, uh, uh, you know, as a lost value. Mm -hmm. you, you didn't lose that time, because what you did was you learned how to learn. You learned new skills, you learned new principles that you can probably apply to in the future. So does that answer your question? Absolutely, definitely. Thank you. I you know, mentioned agility earlier and in, in like in the last five to eight years with the massive jump that everyone's like all tech companies are trying to be agile. You'll fully intend to adopt like agile methodologies. We do have a lot of that, a lot more of that. We do, especially with since we've uh, hired Matthew Gisantana to do a lot of the project management that he's doing. We've seen um, we're transitioning over into some new tools that are going to help Maybe. us focus on that and focus forward. Um, all the new together work stuff we're doing is actually in Jira. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're looking at, at making sure that we're following true agile methodologies when we when we work on stuff like that. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah, like that's a focus. And we know that that's, that's how we build the best software. That's how we've built uh, the payment platform that we built for yeah. um, together work. That's how we, and we've just built superior products that way. So yeah, that's a focus. That's a direction that we have, absolutely. I know that's important to you because of the stuff that you're working on right now. Any other questions? It's been great. Well, I want to thank you both. For being here. Sorry, thank you so much for having us. And John, I'd like to give you a token of our oh, appreciation for being you. here today. Thank you so much. Appreciate it very thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you guys. We appreciate it. Thank you.